can see it. Can see it. Okay. So a few minutes late. Let's go ahead and get started. Uh, so today's presentation is about creating a performance measurements framework. That's so we can, as the title slide suggests, inform priorities and help with growth. Yeah, we're recording this. <laughs> so I'm Chad Hester. I work uh, for Unleashed Technologies as a solutions architect. I've been a web developer for 20 years and working with Drupal and open source for 10. I mostly focus on information architecture and UX uh, strategy. And of course, I'm an advocate for open source software and user experience. So is this presentation for you? So we're going to try to answer a couple key things, um, how to use data to inform uh, design strategy and priorities, uh, how to develop into a growth engine. And we'll explain that in a second. Um, how to make adjustments for uh, whatever it is that you're building and help with continuous improvements. And of course, work together as a team. We don't want to work in a vacuum. It doesn't really work really well. So the point of this is to uh, develop a framework to guide success. And we don't just want to turn wrenches. That's not really what we're trying to accomplish. This, you know, turning wrenches just doesn't help. We want to learn how to grow. So where do we start? So part of this comes from existing uh, knowledge. So lean startup, agile development practices, growth-driven design. This is an example of how growth engines work. And depending on what sort of product or service you're developing, you may align or your client may align, depending on if it's for you or for a client, with one of these growth engines. As you can see, some of the descriptions here. You usually fall into one of these three. You don't want to really touch all of them or more than one. You want to maintain some focus. And when we're talking about growth engines, there are certain metrics that come into play with monitoring the health of that growth engine. Now, I'm not going to get into too much detail about what these things are. You can read about this on your own in Lean Startup, a book by Eric Ries. But the point is, is that measurements matter in terms of understanding your success. So let's start off with a hypothesis for this idea of growth. The hypothesis that we're working with is that uh, performance measurements framework, what we're going to discuss today, is about allowing us to build more effective continuous improvements using data-driven learning as a team. So again, not working in a vacuum. The performance measurements framework really is these first three steps. The idea is to get you to the point of a growth loop, an engine, a cycle, whatever you want to call it. And this is part of that build, measure, learn pattern that you've probably heard about in a few different places. So we use data to learn, we come up with ideas to build, and whatever it is that we produce, we want to measure that and then loop back around. So why a performance measurements framework? Because we want unified team goals. If I ask every single one of you what success looks like for the project that you're working on, if you were all working on the same project, I'm probably going to get a completely different answer from most of you. There, there's probably some overlap, but the point is, is it's not about where it overlaps, it's where it's different. And we need to talk about that to get some unification. So we want to have a measurable impact. So how do we do that? We want to learn together. Because if we're all learning individually, it's not really productive to success. So what does this involve? This involves key performance indicators. I'm sure you've heard about this before, but there's so many different things that you can measure. Key performance indicators are not page views. They are not uh, bounce rates. Those metrics matter when you're trying to learn and study different things, but in most cases, that's not what a business or an organization succeeds off of. That's not what users really need, unless you're YouTube and you're making lots of money off of advertisements. Key system attributes are also a very important thing, and we'll talk a little bit more about this. These are the hypotheses that you come up with to support your KPIs. And then lastly, we need to produce some sort of documentation that anybody can look at and the whole team can rally behind. 
the idea, the fundamental idea here is that whether you're an executive, whether you're a de designer, whether you're a developer, you can look at this document and say, that's what success looks like. Here's how we measure it as a team. Here's how we're building something. And again, this idea of growth, we want some sort of guidance. It's not about the highest paid person's opinion. It's not about design by committee. It's about using some sort of a framework to guide. This stuff costs money. <laughs> this stuff takes time to develop. So let's be honest about what this effort looks like. So the initial effort to develop a performance measurements framework is about 20 hours. Do a bit of intake, a little bit of research, working with your clients or working with internal team members to develop what this looks like. And this is just the starting point. The idea is that you have some sort of a routine. Remember this loop that we're in. What does that loop look like? Well, that loop is really something that takes an investment every single month as well. Roughly four hours a month. Now, obviously, something larger may take a little more time. Something really tiny, probably not much time at all. But it, again, be honest about the efforts so you can set some internal expectations and client expectations if you're an agency. Who's involved? Who, who messes with this stuff? So if you're an agency, uh, if you have uh, monthly retainers with clients, then you can at least start off with KPI. So this is less active measurement. Because honestly, if you don't have a lot of budget, that suggestion of taking four hours a month may be a big spend if you only have a 20 hour a month client. That doesn't leave much to actually do anything. But then you have your larger clients that may actually benefit from that active monitoring and uh, proactive strategy. So who else is involved? Stakeholders? So if you're in an agency or if this is for your own internal company, then stakeholders matter. These are people that you need to get involved early. In project management, when a stakeholder is not involved early, we call that late thrashing. This idea that somebody comes in, flips the table, and totally disturbs the idea of what it is that you can produce and you kind of have to start over. So you want to involve them early, especially people that are uh, uh, challenging or antagonistic. Subject matter experts, identify these people early as well. They don't know it all, they have some assumptions, but they have experience and you want to tap into that. And no website works in a vacuum, they have users. Know who those users are. If you go to BGE's website, are you going there to look at web pages? No, you're going there to pay a bill, you're going there to report an outage. These are human activities and it's important to understand what those things are. So work with those users as early as possible to validate any assumptions that you have. And of course, what we call the performance measurements framework participants. Think of it sort of like King Author's Court. It's this idea of a round table discussion. Different perspectives matter. So if you have a designer, if you have a developer, if you have a business analyst, if you have other stakeholders that are participating, they're all a part of that discussion because they bring something unique to the table. They also bring empathy, and that's very important. So we've been talking some general theory. Let's go ahead and get started. If you want to apply this starting today for your own organization or for client projects, we start with intake. Just like go into the hospital, you got to tell them what the problem is. Well, how do we understand the problem with websites? There's an organization. They have their goals. Maybe you have a website that's an e-commerce site. How much are you trying to do in sales? How do you generate leads? Those are goals that are already known in a lot of cases. There might already be some KPIs and some target goals, some stretch goals that you can analyze. There may be departments that you can talk to. There may be other stakeholders. You just want to tease that out. But we're trying to look for things that are measurable, not just objectives. I'd like to build a website that has an event calendar. That's not what we're looking for. That's nice, but that's not what we're looking for. We're looking for, I want to increase awareness for my organization. I want to generate sales, that type of thing. As we said earlier, users matter. We don't build websites for ourselves, typically. 
sometimes there are intranet sites and, and we understand that, but then we're the users of those websites and we need to understand our behavior. But we need to understand the behavior of the user base so that way we can design for them. We also want to analyze what data sources we're measuring against. So this could be Google Analytics, it could be a CRM, it could be some sort of a sales platform, it could be some other sort of metrics tool, it could just be pencil and paper. Just understand where that data is coming from and who's responsible for updating it on a frequent basis. So that's your intake. That's the information that you need to get started. So now you triage, pretty simple. So in triage, we take a look at those notes as a team because everybody looks at these things differently. And we wanna use a worksheet of some sort to organize these things fluidly. So in a worksheet, we'll try to make usually different tabs to help organize these things. And if it's not a worksheet uh, in the sense of Google Sheets or, or Excel, it can just be a worksheet in the sense that you have some sort of pen and paper that's making notes of these things in a way that you can share with the rest of the team to show your work because this worksheet, you'll update this throughout the life of that project. So we want to collect the business goals. Again, these are the very specific points that have numeric targets and some sort of measurement involved. Conversion funnels. Conversion funnels aren't always just your website itself. So if I come to a conference like this, I might generate a lead. This is a valid touch point in a conversion funnel, but that might turn into a sale eventually, which may involve your website. Uh, in other cases, it might be a phone call. In other cases, it might be an email. In other cases, it might just be a brochure that you hand to someone. Those are all valid touch points in a conversion funnel, but is it a conversion funnel that your website participates in? So we want to make note of that because that's something that we can affect, that's something that we can improve. Critical pathways, kind of similar. So if I said that I have a website for a university, a critical pathway would be something like going and looking for financial aid. We want to make note of those critical pathways that exist because they matter in terms of being able to measure success. Audience segments, not quite the same thing as user personas. Audience segments are just the way you sub-segment who the people are, the human beings are, and what sort of roles they may have. And this can have complete overlap. You may have people that are um, in, in multiple groups. So analyzing that can help you generate empathy, and then you can generate things like personas later on for the sake of design. But understanding this helps you prepare to understand, again, what success looks like, so that way you can empathize. Document user activities and tasks. What are people doing on the website? whether it's now or in the future, because again, that helps shape a picture of success. So once you have all this information in that worksheet, then you can come up with ideas for key performance indicators and key system attributes. So after you come up with those ideas, you wanna meet with a team to try to tease these things out. What's a viable starting KPI? Now, as the name implies, key performance indicators, you don't have 50 of these things. It's too, typically as many as about half a dozen. Anything more than that, you're escaping that moniker key. These also are not those vanity metrics that we were talking about. Page views is not success because you can also get a lot of false positives. How do you know the right people are coming to the website? Instead, it's things like increased sales volume, increased leads, increased advocacy. So it's important to identify the KPIs that match with a lot of those different things that we were just looking at. And then what are the supportive key system attributes that are the hypotheses that we think will affect those KPIs? It's okay for wrong. Now, if you have validated KSAs, key system attributes, that's fantastic because those are stronger starting points that can help push those metrics forward. So again, we're talking about just the basic foundation of gathering information to understand how to measure success. This is just a framework, we're grooming this up. We wanna document this in a way that anybody can digest. Not everybody cares what the word KPI means, but they certainly do care about seeing numbers go up. So we want to review all of these sort of things with all the stakeholders involved, the team 
that you feel is guiding the success of whatever it is that you're working on. So you review those two things that you came together to see whether or not those are a good starting point. You documented it. Now you have a responsibility for demonstrating your work. You can make revisions. It's fine. Remember, this is just a starting point. This will change. This is a living thing. Think of this sort of like a bill going through Congress. Then it becomes law. That law guides the entire team's efforts, but that law can change. The team can come back together and say, you know what? Let's make some tweaks. Totally fine. The KPIs influence your design. So if you do nothing else proactively to measure things, minimally, those key performance indicators can get the whole team to rally behind what it is success looks like, and more importantly, prioritize things. If we know pretty early on that a revenue stream is sub-segmented into different pieces, so for example, maybe I get a lot of revenue from membership dues, but not much from donations. Are you going to focus a lot of effort building out a donation portal versus leaving a haphazard membership dues payment portal? So that helps prioritize your efforts and it gets you out of the argument and puts the measurements of success into the argument. Again, as I said a few times, I can't drill this home enough. Key system attributes, the things that you build to support uh, the things that you're measuring for success, they are just hypotheses until you validate them. And even after you test these things and try to demonstrate that this is helping your KPI, that can change over time. Your audience interests can change. So it's important that you hold yourself responsible. Again, it's not about the highest paid person's opinion. It's not about design by committee and all these fun buzzwords. It's about proving that what your theory is, is actually helping. And if not, there's this idea of failing early. So if you can prove that it's wrong, Pull it out. It's okay. Have a lighter site, less to maintain. <laughs> so we're trying to produce a document that I could share with an executive, someone that does not care about the technical jargon. This is only a few pages long. This is something that a designer can look at and say, this is what success looks like. Here's how it's measured. Here's where this data is coming from. And here are the things that we intend to build. Key system attributes are something you can point at in the website and say, I can see that. It's working and here's how it works, and therefore it should help influence the things that we're looking at for success. So we want to identify how KPIs are measured. This could be a really complicated formula, document that. Or it could be as simple as the number comes from Google Analytics, we just know what it is. Just acknowledge that. Also acknowledge goals and stretch goals. So if my company wants to make $4 million this year, that's a sales goal. That's important. You want to document that. And maybe my stretch goal is $5 million. Document that too. So that everybody that looks at this document knows what your goal is. They are actively participating in it. Identify in that document whether or not a key system attribute, again, the things that you build to support the KPIs, identify whether or not it's already validated. If you've already done testing on something, prototyping, and proven, this is something that can help support this KPI. Make a note of that. If not, note that it's not been validated, and then that becomes the team's responsibility to test. The last two things that you want in this document is identifying who participates in your routine meetings to review measurements and learn together. If you know who that is, we know how to interact together. And you want to schedule those measurements. So how routinely are you actually pulling this? Is this monthly? Is this weekly? Is this quarterly? You need to know that. Typically, we break this up into a couple of different buckets. So monthly maybe is just keeping a finger on the pulse. How are things going? How are things trending? We're not necessarily reacting or getting too alarmed. But instead, we're more focused on is the data looking good? Do I need to tweak something in the system? Am I measuring something properly? Then you may have a quarterly meeting which looks back at the past three months and says over the next three months, we want to work on these small initiatives or proactive growth. And then you may have a yearly meeting where you take a look back at the previous year and you say, here are the big initiatives for the next year. So it's important to come up with that schedule together and put that in that document. 
And whenever you schedule meetings with people, I can't stress this enough, have an agenda in there. No, let people know how to be prepared for these meetings. So how do we prepare to measure? This is that build, measure, learn loop. Well, how are we measuring? Well, configure your data sources first. Is Google Analytics set up? Is your CRM set up? Are all the systems responsible for pulling data configured properly to provide data? If not, that's definitely something you've got to do. We also like to come up with what are called uh, key performance indicator dashboards. This could be something through Google uh, Data Studio. This could be something internal, a website. This could just be a simple spreadsheet. Have something that the whole team can take a look at at any given time. If I want to see the health of a website, I should be able to pull something up. Make sure that that data going into that data, uh, uh, that dashboard is calibrated, is accurate, and it's clear. I shouldn't have to go ask somebody how to understand the data. If I'm taking a look at sales volume, I shouldn't have somebody have to explain how to read that. And if so, fix it. Make it clear. And then make sure that that's updated routinely. Put it in a calendar. Designate somebody that's responsible for updating that dashboard. If it's through an integration point, even better. Then you don't have to worry about it. But sometimes data comes through many hands, and you need to have that on a schedule. So we want to routinely review this with the whole team. Remember that round table idea. Schedule a recurring team presentation. This is if you're an agency with your clients. This also involves your development team. It may even involve designers or whoever else you think should be at that table. Sometimes it's a bigger group for a less frequent meeting, like the quarterly and yearly. Sometimes it's a tiny group, like a project manager and a lead developer, along with your clients, just to keep a finger on that pulse and, and to be responsible for how things are trending. You'll start off with an internal evaluation. This is just whoever is responsible for the building of the website and keeping it moving forward. So this, again, might just be a project manager and a lead developer, just gathering the information to make sure that that dashboard is updated. And then prepare a presentation, like the one you're looking at right now. Prepare something. Nobody wants to look at tons of technical documents or seeing you fiddle around with, with configuration. They just want it all presented to them. These might be CEOs. These might be project managers at, at your uh, client's company. But they just want to see a presentation. What goes in that presentation? Well, gather your measurements as a group, take a look at them, and then a constant foul that people encounter is when you take a look at data, you're instantly judging it. You have to separate that. Just make an observation that the, the factual information is what it is. Just document it. Make note of that in, in the slides of your presentation. So if you have five KPIs, you should have five slides that clearly indicate what the data is for the month. Then you can make recommendations. Nobody has to accept your recommendations. So recommendations can include four typical things. We took a look at the data, and it doesn't make any sense. That's OK. We can change that. We can work on that together. Not everything needs to be perfect. Remember this phrase, good enough. Is it good enough to make recommendations? If not, it's OK. We'll fix it. And we'll take a look next month. There's no urgency here. The next thing that we can recommend is testing and validating those built KSAs. This is that responsibility. I said that building the event calendar would help this KPI, but shucks, it's not doing it. Why? That requires testing. Then you might have some research opportunities that you want to recommend. Not everything is something that you can instantly say, here's the effort involved in building this thing. Or we think this is valuable because, well, just because. That's not good enough. If I want to integrate with another system, what does that look like? Do I need to research an API? Do I need to research design techniques? Is it a new technology? It's OK. It could take several months to do research. But that's a recommendation you can make. And the client can say, nope. Don't do it. We don't have budget for that. Totally fine. But at least you put it on the table. It's that roundtable discussion. And then last, and certainly not least, is backlog recommendations. If you know what you can build, put it in the backlog. It doesn't have to be built, but it shows up in that backlog, and you can prioritize that as a team. 
That's that agile development priorities. So we come back to this whole idea of build, measure, learn. You want to get into that loop. That is your growth engine. That engine can change over time. Say, for example, you have a brand new website. You have some early adopters. That's your audience. Well, are there always going to be early adopters? Probably not. You want to probably hit a bigger market. Maybe it's a soft launch. And then you want to expand out. Maybe you're a very well-established organization, and this web website already has a very clear audience. But maybe your business needs change. Maybe your user needs change. Maybe the way that people behaved or the information that they were seeking, that changes. So when that happens, we pivot. <laughs> I'm sure you've heard this word before. So when you pivot, everything that we just described, you do it all over again. You reanalyze what KPIs make sense. You reanalyze what KSAs make sense. You try to validate that. And then you go right back into that growth engine, which may have encountered some adjustment. So maybe it's viral growth engine. Maybe it's paid growth engine. Maybe it's sticky growth engine. Whatever growth engine you're in, that can change. But that also changes what you're trying to measure to succeed. So where do we go from here? I want you to learn. I want you to, to understand how this applies to you. Um, there are a lot of different resources that generated what it is that you saw in today's presentation. I love learning. I love these sort of meetups. So I also have mentors that help me with this sort of thing. I do social events just like this. I encourage you all to participate in activities, even if it's just a test workshop, a theoretical thing. Get started and practice. Reading a book is only so good. If you can't apply that knowledge, what was that really worth? So a few of the influences for this are Lead Startup. There's, there's a main book by Eric Ries, and there's a bunch of other books that practice this too. So there's The Startup Way. There's uh, Lean UX. There's a lot of these different books that kind of cultivate the same basic principles of that build, measure, learn loop, this idea that you're hitting an engine. There are other influences too, like Growth Driven Design, which actually has a certification from HubSpot. So some of this idea of using measurements to influence the decisions that you're making as a team, this is something that you can do in approximately five hours of coursework. It used to be 14 hours. It was very painful. <laughs> and then, of course, agile practices. There are a lot of different forms of the agile methodology that are applied through things like Scrum or Kanban or a, a bunch of different flavors. If you work with a team, this is very helpful. Or if you even work in isolation, this at least helps you prioritize things in a backlog. I just went through some home improvements, and I enjoyed doing my home improvements and lost my anxiety by just using some post-it notes on a whiteboard to say what was to do, what was in progress, and what was done. And then I could work with my contractor to push things through, so that really reduced a lot of my anxiety. So that's, that's really the extent of the presentation. I do want to give some of your time back and, of course, uh, field any questions. But I would be remiss if I didn't say, if you want to work with our company, Unleashed Technologies, based out of Columbia, Maryland, uh, we, we have a few people here. We have a booth. Or if you want to work for us as a developer, designer, whatever we're hiring for at the time, please let us know. We want to talk to you. We're pretty routinely hiring for some sort of position. And uh, of course, last but not least, thank you very much for participating and listening to me rant up here. If you have any feedback or any questions, please let me know. There's an open Q&A. Um, if you want to email us, start at unleash-technologies.com is the email address to uh, send out. And this really long URL here for Bitly, which I should probably abbreviate it, <laughs> is, is what you can use to see the slides that you just saw today. Any questions? Feedback? Yeah. yeah. Um, I mean, some, all of this sounds like it's kind of like a real high level of the process. And you really do this in order to and who's doing this? Is this private 
Sure. So to try to sum up the question for the sake of the recording. Um, so where does this come from? Um, how does it apply to Agile? And who participates? Who, who creates this? That sort of thing. Is that? Yeah. Okay. Um, so a lot of the influence from this, yes, it, it does help with Agile priorities. Uh, in Agile, we have a backlog, the product backlog, and that goes into sprint backlogs. Um, so this is a tool I'm sure many of us have had either clients or internal teams that have a lot of infighting about what the priorities are. Or here's 50 items that must be built, just build them all. Well, my favorite uh, exercise to circumvent that is, okay, you get three. It doesn't mean you can't have these other 47, but you get three. What are the top three that you want us to work on? And we just take small chunks, and that's one way of prioritizing. But this is a stronger way to prioritize. If, if I could attribute um, a large amount of revenue to one specific thing, and you're arguing for this very tiny thing, it's about attributing value. Uh, a common mistake that people make, and it's okay, I make this on occasion too when I forget, is attributing urgency to importance. They are two different things. Just because it's urgent doesn't mean that it's important. That also helps prioritize things. So this helps give you fodder to come to a team discussion, not an argument, not a debate. You've established this as a team. It's a tool that the whole team can use to try to identify what is important, what is valuable. And that can change over time. Everybody has the ability to contribute to that. But it should not be something that is so urgent that you're making bad decisions under duress. Um, and who, who creates this? Well, that depends on who the main strategist is. This could be a project manager. This could be a lead developer. It could be a solutions architect. It could be a UX strategist. It really depends on who's taking that role of wrangling those cats, if you will. It could just be a department lead. The idea is that you're creating some sort of a document through a general framework, a process, if you will, to help guide the team. Yes? Yes? Okay, so the word empathy and why it's important, especially to this. So, being a user experience uh, strategist as well, part of my job and part of my passion, um, it's important to understand that I don't think like you or anybody else in here fully. Um, we all have different backgrounds, but more importantly, we have different motivations. So if I'm building or designing something for you in particular, I need to understand you, not my opinion of you. And that requires research. And there are a lot of tools that we have in the UX world to understand that and to develop that. No one thing gives the whole picture of who a person is and what motivates them to make a decision. But it's the study of human behavior. And we model these things. Now, we have individuals. A persona is not a person. A persona is a way of us capturing just statistical trends in audience segments. So I can say just a good example of empathy that I like to use is I want to buy a car. My dad wants to buy a car. We're two different people. I might want to go online because I love technology and I can browse everything. Hell, I can buy everything online and never even see a person face to face. My dad, he wants to go test drive it. He wants to talk face to face with people. Those are two different audience segments that I can model based on that. And it comes with different motivations. So for me, empathy is about trying to understand a perspective that is not mine as the designer but rather understand that I can't design in a vacuum. It's important to develop that understanding of empathy and be prepared to be wrong and make adjustments. Yes? One of the few strategies that could be applied is identify Sure. Um, so again, key performance indicators, I've said this a couple times, I can't hammer it home enough. They're not the same thing as your metrics. Metrics help you understand the underlying information that generates those measurements. So if I'm taking a look at sales data, the most traditional KPI in our, in our industry, uh, that sales data may come from a few different systems, but you wanna identify the data authority, if you will. 
So one of the slides that we had in here talked about identifying your data sources. It also talks about defining how to measure things. So if there's some sort of complex formula to identify some sort of coefficient or some sort of scoring or something along those lines, then you come up with that as a team and it's okay if you're wrong. Uh, kind of a tangential thing. My wife's dad uh, worked for FEMA, which uh, studied a lot of weather patterns. And she, she's a weather geek. She loves taking a look at weather models. But one of the first things that she uh, told me when taking a look at here comes a blizzard and what's going on is there are a lot of different models to help predict the weather. But nobody knows the future. These are just predictions. The same thing is true with KPIs. We are just trying to make a prediction. We have to hold ourselves responsible for recalibrating whatever model we have. Now, you don't want to change that month after month. Because how are you comparing February's data to March's data to December's data if you're constantly changing? So that first period of time when you're doing measurements, you want to step back and not be reactive. You just want to let the data settle and see, do we need to calibrate it a little bit? Once you hit a point where everybody's comfortable that this data is starting to reflect whether or not you are or are not succeeding, then you can start to engage more and more. It's difficult to be that patient and that disciplined when it comes to data because, well, what CEO doesn't look at a number and say, I need this to change today? This requires a lot more discipline than that. You're not reacting to this stuff every month. You're hardly reacting to it within the first three months. But after that, then you're starting to get more engaged. So the data measurements, you'll typically want to put into some sort of dashboard. What that is is completely up to you with your comfort level and your audience. I'd recommend learning tools like uh, Google Data Studio, which helps make short work of putting together dashboards and you can integrate with different data sources. Or if you want to develop a website that serves as that, you can do that too. But one thing that is really helpful if you work in a team and you have some sort of a display or something that you can set up is putting that display somewhere public that everybody can see on a daily basis to understand how you're doing. Does that answer your question? Okay. Any other questions? Feedback? Yep. Sure. I think so. <laughs> that one? Sure. Um, and since we're on the topic of learning, learning is really important to me. Both, both of my parents were teachers, so I, I like to teach, but I also like to learn tremendously. It's kind of this whole loop, and I want to learn from you, too. You undoubtedly know things that I want to uh, know as well, if it influences or helps me. But I think it's important to distinguish a few uh, different stages in the learning process. So today... How many of you, just show of hands, how many of you understood what KPIs were? All right, that's good. How about uh, key system attributes? All right, about half as many. The point is, is that some of you didn't raise your hand, and that's totally fine. Uh, there comes a point where you uh, encounter information, and maybe it doesn't really seep in. And then you become acquainted with it. Maybe you read a blog post, something like that. That's okay, you may stash it away and do nothing with it for the rest of your life, but you're somewhat acquainted, you can have a conversation about it. Eventually you come to a point where you may say, you know what, I wanna study this. And study is really important in the learning process. But this is where many people make a mistake, myself included, because I'm really excited about learning new things, is that studying is not the same as practicing. It's important to practice what you learn if you want to be good at it, or if you want to be, a better word, effective. So it's okay to practice these things in a, a safe sanitary environment, whether it's like just a, a practice workshop with people or an internal project, something that you can fail. But I want you to fail because we learn from failure and we learn from each other's failures too. So it's important to also have mentors. Any field you're in, regardless of what your job title is, find someone else with that job title and work very closely with them. Because if you're just on an island by yourself, which for a lot of what I do, I really am, you, you need to seek it out.
Any other questions? Feedback? Yeah, um, agile is one of those things that can really aggravate people from, if not any other perspective, this one very specific perspective. How much is it going to cost and when am I going to have it? I want all these things and I want them by this date and here's my budget. Um, agile, it's a bit more organic than that. The, the way that the manifesto and a lot of the training pitches it is working in a highly uncertain environment. Um, but one of the benefits, I think, is just shifting the risk in one direction versus the other. So where does risk fall? If I estimate everything up front, the traditional waterfall approach, I'm going to do all this stuff, the risk ends up being in being wrong. <laughs> or also building something that ends up no longer being needed. So if I say, Here, here's the list of 50 things I need, six months from now, is that risk going to be the same? Or what if I misjudge the effort involved in that? So in Agile, I think it shifts that risk a little bit and puts it more in not knowing, but that's where priorities come in handy. So if you're prioritizing things based on what success looks like, uh, then you can build the things that are most important first and then start to stack underneath that the things that you need doesn't mean that you can't have those 50 things. It's more a matter of when you have those 50 things. Okay. Any other questions or feedback? Good stuff. I think you get 15 minutes back. <laughs> yeah, thank you.